Welcome and thank you for being here today. Uh, popular historian Stephen Ambrose, whose name I'm sure you'll recognize, and who was a UW-Madison alum, established the Ambrose Heseltine Professorship in U.S. Military History in 1998. Ambrose wanted the professorship named for his mentor, former UW-Madison professor William Heseltine. However, the holder of this professorship would not have been able to speak to this luncheon in 1998, or in 1999, or in 2000. In fact, we do not welcome John Hall, the first Ambrose Heseltine professor in U.S. military history to the faculty until 2009. Why, I hope you are asking, did it take 10 years to fill this position? First, the, the pool of faculty with a combination of military experience and academic qualifications is finite. The pool of excellent candidates with the credentials to teach at the University of Wisconsin-Madison is even smaller. Second, the expectations of the Department of History, the College of Letters and Science, and the entire UW-Madison are extremely high. A UW-Madison degree is valuable and sought after because of high expectations and high achievement these expectations inspire. Finally, we have a responsibility to the memory of Stephen Ambrose and to his family to find the best possible person to hold this name chair. And I am most pleased to report that we recruited the top candidate and I am proud to introduce him to you today. As Dean of the College of Letters and Science, the university's largest college, I must think about the future. Where is the military history teacher and researcher of tomorrow? Is he or she sitting in a high school history class hoping to attend this great university? Is he at his part-time job working enough to save enough money to help his parents pay for his education? Is she on active duty serving her country overseas? Many talented students today are studying, working, serving, and dreaming of becoming Badgers. Our ability to educate and train these students is critically important for the well-being of society. The university's quality and ranking, as well as the value of its degree, depend on keeping the university great and allowing it to do what it does best. It is not a question of asking the state for more funding. We are grateful for the state support we receive but to ask for the flexibility to use our own resources. We must consider rebalancing the partnership between the state, our students, alumni, donors, parents, and friends. This is the basis of the new Badger partnership that Chancellor Martin has proposed and which the faculty has endorsed. A component of the new Badger partnership is the ability to set our own tuition rates. The goal is twofold. First, is a tuition price that more accurately reflects the cost of UW-Madison education. Second, is increased need-based financial aid to keep a UW-Madison education affordable and accessible to qualified students. Even though our tuition is second lowest in the Big Ten, second lowest, the price tag for one year of education, including tuition, room, and board, is $20,000, over $20,000 for in-state students. Need-based financial aid has both an immediate and long-term ripple effect on the university's quality and value. Making such an education possible and affordable benefits everyone. Economic diversity enriches the campus experience and keeps the public university truly open to the public. It produces citizens prepared to live, work, and lead in the real world and it drives our nation's growth by providing a world-class education to a broader cross-section of the workforce. Chancellor Martin has made the Great People Scholarship Campaign the top campus priority because this is the foundation of excellence across the board from programs and improved student services to recruitment and retention of top faculty. Sustaining the quality of the university begins with supporting students. I would be happy to answer your questions about either the Badger Partnership or Great People Scholarships, or you can learn more on the UW Wisconsin website or the UW Foundation website at supportuw.org. Now, however, it is your turn to become students of a new thought-provoking and important area of historical study. Today's speaker, Professor John Hall, 
may also be correctly called Major Hall. He served more than 15 years as an active duty U.S. Army officer. John grew up near Whitewater and is the son of a Vietnam veteran. He is a graduate of West Point and returned there to teach history from 2003 to 2006, earning an Excellence in Teacher Award. He received his doctorate from the University of North Carolina in 2007. John's primary area of research is the late 18th and 19th century, and his first book, Uncommon Defense, Indian Allies in the Black Hawk War, was published in 2009 and is a groundbreaking interpretation of the development of American military relations with Native Americans. In his work, he seeks to identify historical themes that can enlighten and inform current military possible. It is Im policy. It is impossible, he has said, to anticipate the future without understanding the past. I am confident that your immediate future includes an educational and entertaining presentation. Please welcome John Hall. Thank you, Gary, and uh, let me begin by saying what a pleasure it is to be with all of you here today. So thank you also for attending. I'm indebted not only to the UW Foundation for extending to me the invitation to speak to you here today, but also, as Gary mentioned, to the late Stephen Ambrose, his family, and all of those who answered his call to endow a chair in American military history here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. It's truly an honor to occupy this chair, and it is in the spirit of his bequest, which places such a high importance on community involvement and outreach, that I'm with you here today. I'd also like to single out for thanks Mary Anderson, who I understand recommended me as a potential speaker for this Bascom Hill Society luncheon series. Mary, I've come to find out, has an abiding interest in World War II, and she thought, who better to indulge this personal interest than the holder of the new Ambrose Heseltine professorship? The only problem is that, while I certainly spend a fair amount of time teaching World War II, as Gary indicated, I don't call myself a World War II historian. This is not the period that I specialize in. Uh, most often, when I go off on public speaking junkets, I'm talking about the early Republic, Jacksonian America, most recently the American Revolution, where I've done my own research and done my own scholarship. And I've, I've focused mostly on what we would today call irregular warfare, uh, and also Native American history. So when I accepted the invitation, I was kind of perplexed what I was going to talk about here today. Mary wants the, the, the World War II topic, not really my specialty. So fortunately, I hope, I hope, fortunately, I had gone through this process very recently. Last fall, I was invited to speak at the World War II Glider Symposium that was here in town, and, and, and I told the, the, the uh, project or the, the conference organizer much the same thing. I said, I, I'd love to speak. I really feel like I must speak. I'm the Ambrose professor. I have to speak at the World War II Glider Symposium, but, but I want to give it something original. That's not what I work on. And she said, well, maybe, maybe you could do code talkers. And so I thought about that. And I, maybe I could do code talkers. That's, that's interesting. And I started looking into it, and I contacted uh, an anthropologist down at University of Missouri named Bill Meadows, who is the nation's leading expert on, on code talkers, has testified before Congress recently, and, and, and started figuring out what kind of source base I'd need to get my, my mind wrapped around. And I realized soon enough, why don't I just invite Bill Meadows up here to talk about code talkers? And so I have, and he will be speaking at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum next Tuesday at 7 p.m. And so if you are here in part because you have a deep interest in native code talkers during World War II, I highly recommend that you go and see Bill Meadows speak at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum next week. I also gently recommend you save all of your hard questions about code talkers for <laughs> Professor Bill Meadows over there. So when I got the initial invitation and I wanted to do something on, on World War II, but something that related to my research interests, I was contemplating how could I bring these diverse topics together in something that was relevant, but at once original. And I was doing this in my office, and I found that the answer was literally staring me right in the face. The poster that you see here on the left-hand side of the screen has hung in either my home or my office since I first acquired it in the mid-1990s. 
At that time, I was a lieutenant in the 101st Airborne Division, and it was one of the top selling items at the gift shop of the Donald F. Pratt Museum, which is open 364 days a year at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and is named after the assistant division commander of the 101st who died in a glider crash on D-Day in the invasion of Normandy. The poster has proven over the years to be quite a conversation piece. As you might imagine, one thing you can't fully appreciate on the slide is the scale of the poster, which stands about five feet tall. Nearly everyone who has seen this poster asks, asks me to explain its meaning. The short answer to this question is, I'm not entirely certain what it means, but I've been working for a long time on developing a longer answer to this question, and it's the answer that I would like to share with you all today. For the completely unfamiliar, the poster seems to indulge in some sort of anachronistic fantasy by outfooting a colonial era Native American warrior in the garb of a World War II paratrooper. Students of World War II, however, may be familiar with the adjacent photographs, which obviously provided the inspiration for the poster. These photos were taken by a Stars and Stripes reporter on June 5th. 1944, the day before D-Day, as members of the demolition section of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment and attachments from the 326th Airborne Engineers prepared themselves for their rendezvous with destiny across the English Channel. The soldier behind this masquerade, for these were Anglo-Americans and they were merely plain Indian, was a rough and tumble Oklahoman named James McNasty McNeese. Now, as you might gather from his nickname, McNasty was not particularly fond of military discipline. And while he was attending airborne training at Camp Tacoa, Georgia, he decided that he had a religious aversion to standing in formation for evening retreat, where they retired the flag. So he decided to skip it, and instead went to the PX to drink beer and eat peanuts. When confronted by his superiors and asked to explain his conduct, he stated plainly, I like beer and peanuts, and I don't like retreat. <laughs> Informed that he had better come up with a better answer quick, he claimed that his mother was an Indian uh, nature worshiper, and that it was against her, and hence his, religion to stand in formation for retreat. As a matter of fact, McNeese was vaguely aware that his mother was part Indian by blood. But in no sense did he, she, or their family identify themselves as Indians. And it wasn't even until after the war that he learned that she was, in fact, half Choctaw. His claim to Indian roots was, in fact, nothing more than a ploy, ultimately futile, designed to get him out of parade. Nevertheless, McNeese was not done playing around with this assumed Indian identity. While in England, preparing for the invasion of Normandy, he came by the common belief that France was infested with lice, and he decided to shave his head, or part of it, anyway. When asked by his comrades what he was doing with this mohawk haircut, a strip of hair left down the middle, McNeese explained that the haircut, along with the practice of collecting human scalps, was part of his Indian heritage. <laughs> by his own admission, he was trying to pull the chain of some of his more religious comrades, but they went along with the game, not only shaving their own heads, but also donning the war paint. But if you look closely at the poster, you'll note that the mannequin depicts not a European dressed up like an Indian, but rather an American Indian dressed up like a paratrooper. Herein lies the difficulty of answering the seemingly simple question, what's with the poster? Is it possible that the art department responsible for producing it, simply got lazy and neglected this attention to detail. After digging a little bit into the origins of the poster, I am convinced that this is not the case. Rather, I suspect that Michel de Trez, the Belgian museum curator responsible for the poster, as well as the exhibition that it advertised, was drawing on a very long European tradition of looking upon romanticized Indians as quintessential symbols of America. This tradition dates back at least to the 18th century and was deliberately fostered by Americans like Benjamin Franklin, who tried to manufacture a unique American identity that would distinguish the new nation from its European antecedents. European intellectuals of the day, like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, elaborated on the idea, depicting Native Americans as 
noble savages who lived in peace and harmony with their surroundings and nature and thereby represented an ideal by which he and his fellow intellectuals could critique their own decadent societies. Although Rousseau's notion of an Indian existed only in his own mind, it continues to exert a powerful influence on how Europeans and many Americans conceive about Indians today. Monsieur de Trez, it appears, was not immune to the allure of this romantic stereotype, which is manifest not only in this poster, but also in a photo essay he published in 1994. Titled American Warriors, it contains roughly 200 pages of photographs of American paratroopers preparing for the invasion of Normandy. And fully 15 of these are dedicated to the handful of troopers who decked themselves out as Indians. It appears that Detrez was disappointed that there was no one among this group who conformed closely to his image, his ideal, of a genuine Native American warrior. As he included in the book, various shots of this very mannequin accompanied by the following caption. This 326th Engineers Master Sergeant shows some real American Native blood. As a tribal ancestral tradition, he has a Mohawk haircut and a face daubed like a fierce American Indian warrior. He is an American Sioux Indian named Gray Eagle. That no such person ever existed does not seem to have troubled Monsieur de Trez. But it does beg the question of why he felt compelled to invent a Native American veteran of the Second World War when he had roughly 25,000 of the genuine article to choose from. As he has not yet responded to my request for an explanation, I am left to assume that it is because few of the actual Native Americans who served in World War II matched his notion of a real Indian, which is to say a romanticized construction from an imagined past. But this should come as no surprise to us, really, particularly as we examine the enduring images and recollections of those who did serve in the Second World War. Without a doubt, the most famous of these are the fabled Navajo Code Talkers and the Pima Indian, Ira Hayes, who helped hoist the American flag over Mount Suribachi during the Battle of Iwo Jima and was later immortalized in a Johnny Cash song and more recently in a Hollywood motion picture. These images, all of Marines and all associated with the Pacific Theater of Operations, have largely defined Americans' conception of Native American contributions in the Second World War. Yet it bears mentioning that of the 25,000 Indians who served in this conflict, out of a service-eligible population of only about 42,000, fewer than 1,000 served in the Marine Corps, and only 420 of them were Navajo code hawkers. What then of the others? And why have their images not found a lodging place in America's collective memory of Native participation in World War II? Their absence is no accident, I think. Indeed, it was the considered consequence of a policy with roots in Thomas Jefferson's conviction that Native Americans would either have to assimilate into Anglo-American society or vanish forever from this earth. If the former option represented the lesser of these two evils, it nevertheless demanded an incredible sacrifice from Native communities, which were forced to surrender not only their culture, but also any claim in the Anglo-American mind to the nobility associated with their traditional lifestyle. Hence, Jefferson's vision presented the Indians with a stark and indeed terrifying choice. Perish with honor and nobility, or live on as second-class citizens, neither real Indians nor full Americans. Contrary to many popular perceptions, the US government had no desire to wash its hands in the blood of America's indigenous peoples. So it vigorously pursued the second option training Indians as farmers and industrial workers, educating their children in boarding schools, and forbidding native customs and languages, and converting tribally owned lands into private patents. Oops, excuse me. Throughout this assault on native culture, Indian people clung tenaciously to their identity as sovereign peoples. But in the eyes of most white Americans, they had long since ceased being real Indians simply because they no longer bore any resemblance to Rousseau's noble savage or our friend Gray Eagle the mannequin. By the early 20th century, Indians lived in a miserable, liminal state, denied recognition either as American citizens or as authentic, 
real Indians. Because of their ambiguous place, the U.S. government did not conscript American Indians during the First World War, although 10,000 of them volunteered to serve. Ostensibly, to recognize them for this volunteer service, in 1924, the U.S. Congress granted Indians American citizenship. But many Native communities looked upon this reward as a Trojan horse, by which the government meant to deprive the tribes of their sovereignty at long last. As a consequence, many Natives challenged both the Citizenship Act and the 1940 Selective Service Act, which this time did subject Native Americans to conscription. At issue was not Indian willingness to serve or to fight, but the principle that they would do so not merely as Americans, but also as sovereign Indian nations. Indeed, many Indians resented their exclusion from the armed forces, whether it was because they could not read or write, they were too old, or they were missing too many teeth. I don't want to bite them, I just want to shoot them, protested one angry, dentally impaired Ojibwa at Leech Lake. Over time, the draft boards gradually relaxed their standards for eager Indian volunteers. And after Congress declared war on December 8th of 1941, Indians volunteered in such numbers for this war that the Saturday Evening Post commented, we would not need selective service if all volunteered like Indians. Given their very rocky relationship with the U.S. government, one is inclined to wonder why so many Indians wanted to serve in the first place. Some fought for a United States that they regarded as their society, their country, while others saw themselves fighting with a United States that they considered their ally. Indeed, some Indians explicitly cited treaty obligations dating back to the 19th and 18th centuries, claiming that their people had entered into solemn alliances with the United States and that they were determined to uphold these. More typical, perhaps, were the sentiments of Fisk Cloud, a Ho-Chunk elder from Wisconsin and tribal newspaper reporter who argued that Indians had an even greater obligation to defend their country because it was theirs in the first place and it remained their responsibility to safeguard this land. Whatever their motives, on the eve of Pearl Harbor, 4,000 Indians were in uniform, including Brigadier General Clarence Tinker, an Oklahoma Osage who became the first Native American Major General in U.S. history, and at the Battle of Midway, the first U.S. General Officer to die in the war. Oddly enough, even Commissioner of Indian Affairs John Collier wasn't aware that Tinker was an Indian until he saw a press release from the U.S. Army Air Forces that identified him as such. But this is precisely how most Americans wanted to think of Native Americans in the armed forces, not as Creeks, nor as Menominees, nor as Senecas, but simply as Americans. Unlike African Americans, Indians served in racially integrated units. Many Indians would have preferred to serve in all Indian outfits, but the War Department and some in Congress saw integrated wartime service as a golden opportunity to drive home at last their assimilation program. White soldiers, often subscribing to the stereotype that all Indians were preternaturally gifted warriors, generally welcomed Indians into the ranks. And American society at large generally, generally relished the idea that these Indians were fighting on behalf of mainstream Anglo-American society. When journalists honed in on Indian feats of heroism and bravery, they often insinuated that by fighting for the United States, the Indians had finally come over to the right side. A red man will risk his life for a white as thoughtlessly as his ancestor lifted a pale face's scalp gushed a reporter for the New York Herald Tribune. In this context, the appeal of the Code Talkers and Ira Hayes is easier to understand. What better testimony of Indian fidelity is there than this iconic image of Ira Hayes, who is at the far left there at the picture on top of Mount Suribachi, cheek to jowl with his white comrades, raising old glory over a conquered foreign territory? And because Ira Hayes' hands just can't quite reach the pole, it kind of also conveys the subconsciously comfortable notion that he's still not really the equal of his white comrades, but that he wants to be, and he's trying his hardest, which is what the goal of the assimilation program was in the first place. Meanwhile, working wireless handsets rather than rifle bolts, the code talkers suggested that Native Americans could, in fact, find a meaningful role in modern society despite the irony that they demonstrated this ability while using a language that Anglo-Americans had been trying to eradicate for the last half century. 
Indeed, the Indians seemed so well assimilated that McNasty and his paratrooper comrades were free to assume the role of the ostensibly real Indian who were integral to American identity, yet nowhere to be found in reality by 1944, which is probably also why Michel de Trez had to invent Gray Eagle for us. But of course, this notion of authenticity of a real Indian binds native peoples to a particular era of history or a particular place in European imagination. Real Indians, 25,000 of them, were to be found virtually everywhere in the Second World War. And whatever their countrymen wanted to believe, they did not cease to be Indians when they entered federal service. Let me close by sharing the story of one such man. His name was not Gray Eagle, but far less evocatively, Ernest Childers. He wore his hair like the rest of the soldiers in the 45th Infantry Division, and if he ever darkened his face, it was for camouflage rather than to play make-believe. He was born on February 1st, 1918 in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and grew to manhood in an environment designed by the federal government to do away with his family's Creek Indian identity. He was raised on a farmstead carved out of the Creek Reservation after the Dawes Severalty Act of 1887, which was intended to teach the Indians the merits of private property ownership, but instead resulted in the liquidation of two-thirds of the Indian land base. In 1937, Childers graduated from the Chiloco Indian School, founded in 1884 to teach Indians how to farm lands that were incapable of supporting families who lived on them. Later that year, he entered the Oklahoma National Guard, and by September 22, 1943, Second Lieutenant Childers was leading his platoon in an assault against the Italian mountain town of Olivetta Sutra. Despite having broken his ankle in a shell crater, Childers ordered his men to lay suppressive fire in, onto two enemy machine gun nests while he crawled to the rear of one of them, killing two snipers along the way and then doing the same to the machine gun crew. Without grenades, he tossed rocks into the other machine, German machine gun nest, hoping to frighten the crew. When the Germans clambered out of their hole, Childers and one of his troops sent them to the ever after. I assume they thought it was a hand grenade, he later supposed, adding matter-of-factly, because nobody throws rocks. As Childers' platoon continued its advance up the hill, a German forward observer emerged from a house, only to be taken prisoner by Childers, who by this point was completely out of ammunition. After his ankle had healed, Childers rejoined his men for the Battle of Anzio, where he was once more wounded. While in the hospital, he received a summons to see General Jacob Devers. Worrisome news to a very junior officer who wondered what general sends for a second lieutenant. As it turns out, one who wanted to bestow the first Medal of Honor upon a Native American in half a century. When asked why he fought at all, Childers echoed the sentiments of many Native American veterans. The American Indian has only one country to defend, he explained. And when you're picked on, the American Indian never turns his back. Childers went on to serve a full career in the U.S. Army, retiring as a lieutenant colonel in 1965. He battled ill health the remainder of his life, but he lived to witness the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, as well as the subsequent backlash against American Muslims. As a man who had risked his life to defend a nation in which he could at once be an American and a Creek, he was heartbroken by what he saw. Some 60 years after crawling up an Italian hillside with a broken ankle and no grenades, Ernest Childers stepped one last time into the line of fire and once more lobbed a rock at the enemies of his country. Even though I have darker skin than some Americans, that doesn't mean I'm any less patriotic than any other American, he wrote. I am appalled that people who call themselves Americans are attacking and killing other Americans simply because of their skin color. It was the last volley from a great man who passed away after a series of strokes in the spring of 2005. And so, after having spent a good deal of time talking to you about images of phony Native Americans, I wish to leave you with a very different image, that of a real Indian and that of a real American. Thank you. Now I have kept the comments 
fairly brief in order to ser save time for any questions that you might have. But remember, the co-talker questions, I'm just joking. I'll, 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 do, I'll do my best to, to, to handle anything you throw my way. Sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it, it's exactly the same tradition. So I, I focused in on Rousseau, but Rousseau is, is, is he's often pointed to as, as perhaps the, 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 uh, the originator or, 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 or one of the uh, people who most eloquently articulated this idea of a noble savage. But like I said, it has a very long lifespan. Uh, not only in Europe, but also in the United States. And, and, and so Winnetow uh, and, and, and Karl May's work certainly are evidence of this persisting uh, well past Rousseau's time. And there is still a strong evidence of this uh, uh, in Europe, but not exclusively in Europe. I think a, a lot of it has, has migrated back into the United States again. Oh, I'm sorry. He, he's asking uh, I, I, th this notion of a noble savage, and he asked whether uh, Karl May's uh, uh, work, the, the German novelist, and, and his uh, uh, fictitious uh, 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 Apache, is Winnetonot, uh, the, 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 the Apache, the noble savage chief, Winnetow as being an example of this. And I said it is very much an example of that, and that I, I see that as a continuation of this European intellectual tradition, which idealizes the noble savage. And of course, it's a flattering sort of image. It, so th th it's not an entirely bad thing. It's not an entirely exploitative thing. The problem, of course, is that it is such an idealized archetype that it becomes sort of an anvil against which other people and other observers will pound real Indian people, those who actually continue to live in this society because they don't, they don't look like that. They, 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 they have um, um, changed with, with time, as, as all people and all societies must. And as my uh, friend Scott Stevens, who is the director of the, the uh, Darcy McNichol Center at the Newberry Library in Chicago, is fond of saying, that this notion that, that for an Indian to be a real Indian means that they have to look like Gray Eagle, uh, is kind of akin to saying that none of us are real Americans unless we're wearing powdered wigs and have buckles on our shoes, which of course is, is, is laughable. Yes, ma'am. Is that old term, uh, earnest children is available online? Yes, ma'am. You can find that quotation in line. And, it was, and, and Daniel Inouye actually read it to uh, an open session of Congress uh, afterwards. So uh, he, he did not uh, have a very uh, uh, public profile in, in retirement. So after he retired, uh, he, he really um, receded from the public eye, and th this was sort of his last thing. I, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't repeat the question again. But the quotation from Childers, if you are interested in it, uh, is, is pretty accessible online. So if you were simply to search for Ernest Childers, you'll, you'll find that quotation. Yes, sir. Right, and, and, and from our lunchtime conversation, I know you're familiar with the work of, of Patty Lowe, and, and I should also acknowledge Patty, because I, I uh, consulted Patty in, in organizing this talk as well, and, and uh, drew on her uh, inspiration and her ideas. But uh, it remains very important in contemporary society uh, for young Indian men to fulfill traditional gender roles through military service. Throughout this assimilation um, period, the, 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 this really what's a, a societal and cultural crisis of dealing with assimilation, it has a, I think it has a disproportionately harsh effect on the men of native societies vis-a-vis -vis women. Because in sort of a, a, a gendered construct or the, the, the way in which responsibilities within a family and within a society are defined by gender, Indian women have the same responsibilities that they've ever had. It, 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 they, have, they haven't changed uh, in 
kind. They've changed in degree and, and under different circumstances. Men, however, who for uh, generations had served in two principal capacities, unless uh, most men had served in principal capacities, at, at complementary capacities as hunters and warriors. Under this assimilation program, they were supposed to surrender the hunt and, and become farmers, which in most Indian societies was women's work. So they were being required to become women uh, in a sense, and they were forbidden from going uh, 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 on uh, uh, military expeditions against neighboring tribes again, because the, the stabilization of the expansion of, of the United States across the frontier as it, as it shifted over time required peace and stability on the frontier. And this is where most of my work actually deals is in the pre-Civil War time frame. Um, the U.S. Army was, for the most part, um, a flawed, not very adequate peacekeeping organization. That it, it, its job was to maintain peace and stability, which meant avoiding Indian wars. And so usually when you saw an Indian war in this period, it was not the intended design result of a U.S. government decision, but rather a manifestation of the inadequacy of the Army to perform this peacekeeping mission. And I can, if you're interested, I can answer questions about that at, at, at greater length. But uh, I'm afraid now I've, I've drifted away from the, the question. And, and so, yes, there, there's a, a very much uh, um, th this desire to fulfill traditional gender roles. And now I actually, I, I know where I was, was taking that. Is they're stabilizing the frontier then, the government forbade intertribal wars and uh, and closed off that other means of establishing a, a, a male identity or a reputation, stature, and prestige within their, their own societies. And so a common question uh, is you look at my first book deals with Indian allies to the US during the Black Hawk War. And there's other scholarship that looks at the phenomenon of Indian scouts on the Western Plains. And there's this uncomfortable question, you know, wh why are Indians fighting with the United States government that, that, that's dispossessing them. It doesn't, it doesn't seem um, very, uh, it seem very smart, frankly. Uh, in every single instance, though, what you're seeing is local communities making the best of very, very difficult situations and circumstances and accommodating themselves to the world in which they live and at the same time finding some way that they can maintain uh, or, or achieve stature within a traditional culture context by serving as tribal policemen on the reservation, by serving as, as scouts for a U.S. Army outfit and so forth. Yes, sir. Just to follow up on that, you, you mentioned the number of uh, Native Americans that during the Second World War who out of the total population, a large number. Did that continue to be true or that they're more likely to volunteer than the rest of the society? Yes. Uh, on a per capita basis, um, it, Roughly at twice the rate. Is that also true of women? Is it all of, of native women? Yeah. I, I don't. I don't think so. I. I, I don't know uh, off, off the top of my head. I'd have to look at uh, those statistics. Uh, Gary, do you have any idea what? I don't think it applies. Yeah, but 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 it, it at just gender irrelevant as as, as a, a per capita basis. Native Americans uh, uh, serve in our all-volunteer military at, at basically twice the rate of all other ethnic groups. Yes, ma'am. Was there a role for Indian women during World War II? Uh, was there a role for Indian women during World War II? Um, there's not a, and, and, and I honestly don't know the answer to the question, so I'll, I, I will speculate, and I think that there's probably not much of a role for Indian women during World War II, although the opportunities that exist for American women in general to serve during World War II would have been open to Native American women as well. And so um, instances in which you'd have uh, Native American women serving as wax uh, or, or waves or something like that, I think would probably be more common amongst urban dwelling uh, uh, Native population. So, so people who are, are, are already culturally largely assimilated into Anglo-American society. So I'm not familiar with uh, any large-scale service of women leaving, uh, leaving the reservation to go uh, and serve at the time. 
Yes, sir. Well, it, 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 the question is whether or not there's any sort of racial funneling. If, if, if based upon um, in any kind of stereotypes about Native Americans or conceptions of, of what they were good at or what they were bad at, if they would be pushed into certain military occupational specialties. And uh, there is a common phenomenon, and, and Patty Lowe talks about this in, in her documentary, uh, Way of the Warrior, and uh, historian Tom Holm. Uh, excuse me, I think uh, Tom's an anthropologist, but a, a scholar, uh, Tom Holm, also writes about this, uh, that because so many people subscribe to this idea that Native American warriors are natural guerrilla fighters, that, that, that they can walk through the woods without disturbing a leaf or breaking a twig, that they can see in the dark, that they can never be caught in an ambush, uh, that, that they are funneled to the point, essentially. That, that if, you, if you are on patrol um, and, you, and you have a Native American, you want that guy up front because you won't get surprised because he's an Indian and he's supposed to be good at this kind of stuff. And it's, it, it's sort of a catch-22 for a lot of Native veterans because at the one hand, it's not a very enviable position to be always being pushed up to, to be on point and, and everything else, and it's based upon a racial stereotype. On the other hand, it's one of these kind of flattering racial stereotypes. And so some Indian men actually come to believe it themselves or, 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 or think that, that, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm an Indian. I'm supposed to be good at this kind of thing. And so uh, there, there is a strong sort of anecdotal evidence base that suggests that Indians were highly esteemed as, as, as light infantry fighters on, on, on scouts and long distance patrols and things of the sort. Yes, ma'am. I think he was also asking about were there any constraints or restrictions on their movement of actions within the you know, military as there had been with black soldiers. No, not really. Uh, and so the, I'll, I'll repeat the question. I think you probably could hear it in, in, in the back. but but. Elaborating on the original question, are there any restraints, are there any glass ceilings or, or glass walls within the military establishment uh, that would prevent mobility for somebody because they were uh, native? And the answer to that, I think, is predominantly no. Uh, it's a, there is a very real investment in this assimilation program. And I mentioned Clarence Tinker, and you do have uh, major generals, uh, so you've got a major general who's a, 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 of Native American descent, and this has been going on for quite some time. The first Native uh, American West Point graduate, David Moniak, was a Creek Indian who died in the Second Seminole War. Uh, I don't remember what year he died. I think it was uh, probably about 1838 or, or 1837, and so that's well before Henry Ossian Flipper becomes the first black West Point graduate and then endures a career, a short career, full of uh, uh, discrimination and, and I wouldn't call them glass ceilings, I'd call them concrete ceilings. And, and so it, it's, it's very different. Uh, these experiences are, are, are quite different. And, and so I mentioned in the talk that uh, many natives wanted to serve in ethnically or racially homogenous units. They wanted segregation because if, particularly if it was somebody who had not left the reservation in their life, it was very distrustful of Anglo-American society. The idea of going as an individual and being cast into this, this lot of, of, of people that they have a hard time relating to was, was very discomforting. Uh, as you might imagine. And, and so they, they, they lobbied the War Department to have uh, uh, all Indian outfits, but the War Department uh, didn't want to set that precedent, and, the, and, and others in government, as I said in the talk, thought this was a great opportunity to actually complete the assimilation program. Sir, did you have a question?
Thank you, sir. Sir, and then in the back. Somewhat along the comments that were just made, did uh, McNasty, uh, or is your name by uh, James McNeese? McNeese, thank you. <laughs> did he uh, suggest to his uh, fellow soldiers to put the paint on their faces and cut their hair to look like Mohawks to uh, instill in the enemy, the Germans, some concept of the, the savage that was coming across the Atlantic to make them more fearful that they're going to have their I have I have seen that supposition. I I, I don't know. And, and McNeese actually wrote a memoir, and, and that's where I know all about the beer and the peanuts is from his his, his own pen. But um, he, he didn't give any account of that uh, in his memoir. And there was the original Stars and Stripes article went around with it. So I, I have seen that alleged, and I have also seen alleged that. Um, that it succeeded, that it scared the bejesus out of the Germans who, who saw these the devils in baggy pants that had mohawk haircuts and, and, and the, the face paint uh, uh, done up. But um, as, as McNeese is the acknowledged origin of the whole thing, and, and, and he, by his own admission, claims that he was, he was trying to yank the chain of some devout Christians that, that he, he just loved needling all the time, that that was what he was really trying to do, was, was to make the pious among them uncomfortable. Yes, sir. Uh, I, 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 could somebody repeat the, the question for me? Alvin York. Oh, Alvin York. Um, I think Alvin York, if I'm not mistaken, you, you, you are correct, sir, in terms of this being outside of what I've, I really worked on. If I'm not mistaken, and there's probably people in the room that can correct me on this, I think. Alvin York might have had some uh, some Native American blood in his family, but they didn't identify themselves as, as Native Americans. And and there are actually, it, it's a fine line when you when you deal with the topic on whether you judge somebody, you, whether you label somebody to be Indian or not, on the basis of blood in the family or on the basis of their ethnic identity. And so Childers, there are other examples. There are other Native Americans who won the Medal of Honor during World War II. Uh, some of them, I, I think most recently, for instance, you might have seen in the news this bit where there is a, a World War II Medal of Honor winner that, that bucked his homeowners association by flying a big American flag in his yard. And the homeowners association is not going to have any of that. And, and, and so they, they were going to make him take it down until it became a national media item that there's a Medal of Honor winner and his neighbors don't want to let him fly old glory over the lawn. And, uh, and some of the articles have pointed out that he's a, a Native American. And, and um, in terms of blood, that, that, that's true. But uh, unless I'm mistaken, I don't, I don't think he grew up Indian. I, he doesn't, he, he doesn't uh, uh, identify himself ethnically as Indian. And so uh, going back to the question, I, I, I don't recall, but, but I, I'm pretty certain that Alvin York and his family did not identify themselves as, as Native people. Last question? Okay. The, the cigar store Indian. Um, I hate to have a last question that I can't answer. <laughs> I don't know. I know how we got rid of the cigar store Indian, but uh, I don't know how we came to have the cigar store Indian. Okay. Yes, the boarding schools are certainly part of this experience. Um, the, well, part of this the boarding school experience, the, 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 the initial um, um, experiments in this regard were actually um, undertaken by the military. And a gentleman named Pratt 
uh, who actually, I think at St. Augustine was where he began doing this, and then they opened the Carlisle uh, Indian Industrial School at Carlisle, Pennsylvania, which, and you can still go to the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center there and, and see some of the, uh, the display. Um, Interpretation-wise, I've got a little bit of a, a problem. A, a, a mentor and dear friend of mine runs the place now, but they have the, they've got the pictures and everything, and they've got some of the, the, the uh, material culture display. There's no there, there's no sort of moral discomfort whatsoever with the thing. You know, this is where you know we, we we try to turn Indians into white people, um, and it's just kind of matter of fact. And one of the things that's sort of uh, interesting about it, though, in hindsight, is oftentimes the people who were the architects of this assimilation were really did have the most benevolent detentions. These were these were the, the humanitarians of, of of the bunch. And so, in, in terms of contrasting different stereotypes about Americans in the late nineteenth century, if there is a rabid Indian hating frontiersman who thinks the only good Indian is a, a, a dead Indian, the polar opposite of that person was often one of these Indian reformers, so-called, who were the real architects and driving forces behind the assimilation program. So they, they did have, I, I, I acknowledge you, they, they did have what they thought were the best interests of people in mind. Um, we'll end on, I think, an appropriately ambivalent note. <laughs> Thank you so much.